Good, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, and I guess welcome to the second Zoom lecture in uh, 6858. Uh, today, the topic is going to be uh, a continuation of network security. In particular, we're going to focus on SSL TLS. Uh, before we get started, though, uh, let me see. Uh, let's practice a little bit again asking questions and raising hands. Uh, so let me ask, like last time, a question and uh, you can answer. So, for example, uh, what do you like? Uh, let's see what the question is. What do you, uh, what you, what do you dislike most uh, about remote uh, teaching, or remote learning? Uh, and I'll start by giving the, an answer myself. And I guess one of, one of the things I most disliked after the first lecture is that I can't see you. So it's hard for me to see uh, uh, whether I'm going too fast or slow, whether I make any sense at all or uh, whatever. Um, so, uh, so that's my answer. Let me uh, uh, ask some of you what you're thinking. Um, how about, uh, I'm gonna call out some names and hopefully you can answer. Uh, how about, uh, uh, Helene Chu, what do you dislike most? Hi, um, I guess the thing I dislike most is the lack of separation between like the lecture and like my home life. So like my mom <laughs> would be like, oh, it's lunchtime. And I'm like, I can't, <laughs> I'm in lecture. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds sort of very familiar actually. <laughs> uh, how about uh, Johnny Bull? Uh, I was not here to hear the question. Could you repeat it? The question was, what do you like uh, dislike most about uh, online learning and teaching? Um, I think the lack of having like a schedule like I do during the regular school year makes me feel like I'm a lot less productive because I end up working at weird hours in the night just to get stuff done. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it works out. Okay. How about uh, Darius Bob? Uh, I think it's like limited board space uh, in lectures yeah. before you could kind of see everything at once to take notes and now it's kind of like uh, a step at a time. Yeah, I'm going to try something different slightly. I'm going to try, if you see on the screen share, you see the notes. I'm trying to put the old notes on the right side so at least you can see roughly what was on it. Hopefully that will work a little bit better. Uh, okay, well, how about one more? Uh, Lucas Novak. Yeah, uh, the thing I dislike about it the most is uh, there, there's something that makes it easier to engage when it's person to person, uh, both like asking questions afterwards, but also just naturally being able to pay attention. Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna again stop quite often today and ask uh, whether anybody has questions. So feel free to ask them. You can also ask them. I learned last time uh, that. Uh, the uh, people were, uh, I was unable to monitor the, the, the chat list at the same time as, you know, the lecturing and all that kind of stuff. But I asked one of the TAs, we'll uh, uh, keep an eye on the chat list, chat group, and uh, answer any questions uh, or for you or answer them right there. Uh, which actually brings me to something else. Uh, as you know, we're recording the lectures for all the students who are, who are in far away time zones. And, uh, and hopefully they later will have an opportunity to uh, watch it. Uh, but that also means that actually all the chat messages are recorded, so including private messages. So host can actually read the private messages afterwards. Uh, I didn't do it last time. I'm not planning to do it at all, but uh, I just want to warn you that this is the case. Uh, as you probably have noticed, uh, maybe a relevant comment related to 6858, you know, Zoom doesn't seem to have the, the best security uh, practices uh, and even not the best security protocols. Um, so. Uh, with that, maybe I'm going to get started unless there's a question that somebody wants to ask. Uh, I guess one, one small thing. Yeah. Um, on the website, I think the, your, the notes for secure channels isn't uploaded. I don't know if that's something you can fix right now. Um, uh, it should be there. Uh, let me, uh, hey, Nikolai. Nikolai is probably on. Yeah, Nikolai, I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at the check. Out, yeah. Yeah, I, I did commit it and I pushed it this morning, so hopefully it should be there. Um, Thanks. Uh, also, at the end of lecture, I'll be hanging around a little bit, so you still want to ask questions afterwards, uh, as some of you did in the, uh, in the physical lectures, you know, uh, feel free to hang around a little bit too, and then uh, maybe I can ask any other questions. 
and I'll respond to any questions. All right, I'm ready to go. Let's uh, start. So, um, so just to remind you a little bit of where we were last week. Uh, so last week, uh, we started on this topic of network security. Um, and in particular, you know, we looked at the inner core of the network. So, you know, the usual cloud picture, uh, we you know we're, we have clients, we have servers. Um, basically, we ignored uh, sort of the client and the servers and talked mostly what actually is happening inside the packets here. And we discovered that probably the right way to think of all about this is that the inner core is really uh, responsible for providing lifeness, um, uh, but it doesn't really provide any really strong security, including, you know, you don't really know where packets are coming from. And so the, today's tech uh, lecture is going to be about how to set up a secure channel, you know, across uh, this life but insecure uh, core uh, that actually provides much, much more stronger properties. Uh, and the case study that we're going to be looking at as an example of a secure channel is uh, SSL or, or TLS, which is basically all the, pro the protocol that's being used uh, to uh, deliver all your HTTPS uh, traffic. So presumably, you know, my, many of you today actually probably use the TLS. And in fact, you know, probably, uh, uh, and so it's a widely used protocol. Um, okay. So that's the sort of the setting. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about what a secure channel is. Or what are the properties are that the secure channel provides. And there's sort of basically two main uh, properties. One is authenticity. And um, boils down basically that if a client sends a message to the server or the client, uh, the server sends a message back to the client, uh, they know that the other one actually sent it and that, one, that it was not actually changed or adopted or modified by an attacker. Uh, the second one is confidentiality. And in the, with confidentiality, I mean that basically the communication is private. So the communication that's going on between the client and the server, the attacker actually can't listen into it and actually uh, hear or discover what actually the content of the messages are that are crossing uh, the internet. Um, and we're gonna deliver these three properties on a pretty strong uh, threat model, where the threat model is that the attacker sort of sits in the internet in the middle and can delete packets, uh, insert new packets, modify packets, uh, listen onto packets, maybe record them for a long period of time. Uh, and so the, the attacker is a pretty powerful uh, attacker. But despite this, uh, we're gonna provide, you know, authenticity and confidentiality. And so there's a very, turns out to be an incredibly strong foundation uh, for building you know, applications on top. So for example, if you, uh, by providing, you know, the secure channel, uh, you can basically run the web over it and certainly where the web becomes secure. Uh, or you can log, run a login program across your secure channel and certainly you have uh, a secure login. And so it's a, a strong uh, building primitive and it's an actually uh, widely used uh, building primitive. Another thing that's actually pretty cool about this is it actually is well understood to uh, how to build or engineer you know, a secure channel. Uh, and then when, when the crypto is well understood and actually how to use the crypto to build uh, secure channels is also well understood. Um, and, and of course, you know, there are little mistakes here and there. And for example, in uh, the paper we saw for the paper for today, you know, we see that you know, SSL 3.0 actually is not perfect. It has some corner uh, cases, uh, but it actually served as well for, you know, about a decade uh, from 1996 to uh, roughly 2006. You know, by 2006, it became clear that there are all kinds of issues, other issues uh, with SSL 3.0 uh, that we read about today. Um, and so SSL 3.0 actually is not uh, being used at all on the internet anymore. In fact, uh, it's considered to be insecure. And we'll talk a little bit about it in the end of the lecture. Uh, but the subsequent protocols that follow SSL uh, are directly based or inspired on SSL. And sort of many of the same techniques that we uh, saw in the paper actually will also apply uh, to uh, uh, the current set of protocols that are actually being used. Um, so to be able to explain, you know, actually how to build a secure channel, we need to know a little bit about cryptography. And uh, as you know, uh, in, from the beginning of the semester, the uh, 
you know, crypto is not really the topic of this class. And, you know, mostly we outsource it, you know, to uh, 6857, you know, which looks at in detail uh, at crypto. Uh, but we need to know the primitives to actually be able to build secure channels. Uh, and the reason to over review this uh, quickly or if I do a short introduction again um, is also to make sure that you're ready to do lab five. In lab five, in the first part of lab five, you will be using you know, the primitives I've been talking about today uh, and uh, apply them to the, in the context of this uh, uh, authentic or a strong uh, file system that uh, in the context of a file system. So just to get the, 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 the terminology straight, uh, and a number of people asked about this uh, in, uh, in your questions. So encryption is going to mostly be used to solve the problem of confidentiality. And so that really is our primitive to provide sort of a private uh, communication. Then when we talk about uh, signatures, sometimes called MACs, message authentication codes, those are going to be used actually to provide authenticity. So we're going to use two separate primitives in a class of primitives for encryption to actually achieve confidentiality. Another set of primitives, crypto primitives, you know, that typically are called signatures or uh, message authentication codes, MACs. And then we're going to use those for authenticity. So we have two separate goals, two separate set of primitives. Now it turns out that both encryption and signatures come in two flavors, uh, namely public key, as most of you know, uh, public key crypto, and uh, so what's sometimes called symmetric key crypto. Um, and uh, the, we'll see in a second what the differences are, but you know, the, the, the cool thing about public key crypto is that one of the keys can actually stay confidential while the other one is actually made public. Uh, and with symmetric key, both parties will actually have a copy of the same sort of secret key. Uh, but it turns out the public key encryption and, of, uh, and, and signatures are more expensive uh, in terms of the number of cycles they take to actually compute them uh, versus symmetric key. And so typically what protocols work is they start out in the public key uh, domain and then they switch over to a symmetric key domain. Okay, so that's the terminology part. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about, um, you know, the actual primitives. Um, so public key primitives, oops. Uh, the primitives that we have is, you know, first of all, there's a key generation primitive, uh, which uh, produces a, a key pair, a public key and a secret key, sometimes called a, a private key. And the general idea is that the private key can be whatever post that's publicly, you know, put on the internet, uh, doesn't really matter. And, but the secret key is the key that, you know, the, for example, the server or the client, you know, really keeps uh, confidential and doesn't hand out to anybody at all. And then, you know, you can encrypt messages. For example, a client might encrypt a message you know, using the public key. And here's the message. And that produces some ciphertext. And you know the, we're going to assume that you know, basically we're going to uh, that this encrypt message uh, the encrypt primitives is implemented correctly. Uh, how to implement correctly is really a topic of six eight five seven. Uh, but that you know this encryption function actually gives you strong confidentiality uh, guarantees. Um, and you can see here that the message is actually encrypted with the public key, and now the server or the receiver can decrypt is the only one who can decrypt that message using the secret key, and that should produce the message again. Um, uh, so here, what's interesting about it, that you know, one party can actually encrypt with a public key, and another party can, uh, then the only one party can actually decrypt it, because not even only the party that actually holds the, the secret key. Uh, then there's a set of corresponding primitives for signing. Uh, so there's going to be a signature uh, scheme. And typically, the way uh, signing works is that signing is done with the secret key. So you take a, a message, you sign it using the secret key, and that actually produces you know, what's called a signature. And signature is not, nothing else than a bunch of bits. Um, and those bunch of bits you know, can be very, you know, the receiver 
can uh, verify the signature uh, using the public key. Um, whatever message is actually received over the network or a tag or the bits that are received over the network and it supplies the signature. And this function, this will give true or false uh, as an answer. Uh, so if the signature checks out, uh, meaning you know that actually M was signed by the secret by the uh, secret key, um, then you know the function will return true, and otherwise the function will return false. And so this will allow us to basically detect if M uh, was manipulated uh, across the network. So these are the primitives, uh, and there are many ways of implementing this primitive. You know, sometimes you know uh, you're probably familiar with you know, RSA as a crypto uh, core that can be used to actually implement these primitives, uh, or uh, elliptic curve primitives. Uh, and there's basically a whole uh, you know, body of knowledge uh, that uh, uh, describes how you take uh, these uh, primitives or how you actually take these uh, core crypto uh, primitives like RSA and Elliptic and actually implement an API uh, that we just hear, uh, that I just drew out. Uh, and as I said, uh, because uh, RSA and Elliptic Curve actually uh, work with big numbers, you know, like in RSK, K, RSA's case, like big prime numbers, uh, it turns actually to be expensive to implement or to implement uh, to implement encrypt or decrypt or sign or verify, and in fact, you know, this, you should think about it, you know, per operations, you know, that is like a million cycles. Um, so that's public key, and because you know, public key is so uh, expensive, uh, there's a, a corresponding uh, set of uh, primitives uh, for symmetric key. So let me talk about symmetric key. A little bit. Um, so there's also a key generation primitive, and it just produces one key. Uh, and in some way, this key has to be uh, distributed to both uh, the, oops, to both the, uh, to both the uh, sender or you know, to the both parties that are actually involved in the communication. Uh, then there's a, an encrypt primitive. Uh, that takes the key and a message and encrypts it. And then there is a decrypt, the corresponding decrypt primitive that you know, takes the ciphertext that was received and the key and actually produces M again. Uh, and then there's a, uh, because there's a symmetric key and not a public key, the sign and verify function uh, is basically uh, a single thing, which is uh, typically called uh, a message authentication code or Mac, and so that takes a key, a message, and it produces a tag, and then the receiver can verify uh, the tag by, you know, uh, if it receives M, it has the key K, it can recompute, you know, the Mac, and then compare if it gets the same tag as the sender, if it did get the same tag, now we know that basically uh, the message checks out and that nobody or no attacker modified any bits of M uh, in transit. Uh, the, the, the reason that this is called Mac instead of uh, sign uh, is mostly for historical reasons, uh, but then, uh, that terminology persists and, uh, and uh, that is typically uh, uh, how people refer to it. So as message authentication code, but you can think about it basically as the symmetric version of uh, signing and verification or verify. The implementation uh, of these primitives uh, is often at the, the core level, uh, basically uh, based on exclusive OR operations. Um, and therefore they tend to be much more efficient. You're not actually computing with large, large big numbers, uh, but you're just basically computing XORs of uh, bits. Um, and uh, as a result, they're actually uh, quite fast. Uh, a common primitive that you probably uh, have heard of uh, for implementing uh, symmetric key crypto systems or symmetric key APIs uh, is called AES, um, uh, Advanced Encryption Standard, um, um, and you know, it's quite widely used. So those are the core primitives uh, that you're going to be using both in Lab 5 and on top of which uh, also secure channels are built. And so uh, this is sort of a quick review of the, uh, these primitives so that you know what they are. Uh, and again, we're not going to discuss how they are implemented. That's really a topic of 6857. So let me stop here for a second and 
uh, just see if there's any questions. I have a question. Yeah, please. Um, I'm wondering if, and this is this is kind of a bit out there, but how how much or how ready we would be to do encryption with like lattice type um, encryption algorithms that are you know that are like quantumly secure. <laughs> That's a great question, uh, and I'm actually a little bit out of my uh, domain of expertise. Uh, the uh, you know, there's a wide speculation, correct? And you know, what exactly quantum computers will do? Uh, I think for the you know foreseeable future, uh, I'm sort of looking at this from a sort of more engineering or system perspective. For the foreseeable future, I, I don't think we're going to uh, have to worry about this problem uh, that much yet. Uh, and clearly, it, may, it might come up come about that we have to worry a lot about it. Uh, but I think at this point, uh, one doesn't really have to uh, worry about it. Uh, but presumably, this will mean at some point that you know all the crypto primitives have to change. Uh, and there might be somebody on the call or on the lecture that knows more about quantum computing than I, and you know, feel free to jump in and you know, give your perspective if you, if, you have, if you have one. So this is Nikolai. I'm not sure I have too much in knowledge about quantum computing, but my understanding is at least the symmetric key primitives are not really amenable to the kinds of things that uh, quantum computing is good at analyzing or would have good algorithms for. Yeah. So I imagine that AES and uh, recent hash functions like SHA-512 are probably okay. Um, the algebraic things like public key crypto schemes are probably more susceptible and there's post quantum variants of TLS that Google has been already trying out. The main downside is larger public key sizes that are tens of thousands of bits instead of a couple of hundred of bits. Yeah, that's a good point. I forgot to point out that the symmetric key actually is quite different from the public key from the perspective of quantum computing. Um, okay, good. Uh, so let's then switch sort of topics and uh, talk a little bit about in general how to build uh, secure channels. And the way we're going to get started is basically build one that is broken uh, so that we sort of see what things uh, need to be fixed. Um, and so the secure channel uh, that we're uh, protocol that we're going to make is just very simple, uh, mostly just to get started to talk about. So. There's going to be a message, you know, one from the client to the server uh, that basically say, you know, opens up, let's say, a TCP connection, as you know, we discussed last week. And so that doesn't provide any security, but that's just a way of establishing a reliable uh, uh, stream, uh, byte stream to the server, but no, not secure. Uh, so then in step two, uh, the server sends back to the client uh, a public key for the server. So this is the, uh, we're going to start off using public key crypto and also the CE, which is typically done in these uh, channels, uh, is we're going to switch to symmetric key, you know, for, for performance reasons. And so in method three, uh, it's going to go from the client to the server and the client is basically going to propose, you know, basically cook up uh, a uh, symmetric key and encrypt that public key with the uh, public key from the server that it just received in uh, message two. Okay, and so a key is basically nothing else than an, uh, a string of random bits. So the client basically, you know, uh, builds up a random uh, string of bits, encrypts it using the public key of the server and sends it back to the server. And the idea is you now the only the server has the corresponding private key. So it is the only or the corresponding secret key uh, and it's the only one that's going to be able to decrypt, you know, that message. And so that will be the only other party that will actually have this key K. And so uh, from then on, basically the server and the client can just communicate by encrypting, you know, messages using the symmetric key K. And then can use basically, you know, AUS or some other, you know, fast uh, symmetric key system. And so that's the basic protocol. And immediately, you know, there's a bunch of issues with this protocol uh, that we need to fix. Uh, and that's basically what the rest of the lecture is about, is sort of taking this protocol and making it better. And, you know, let me point out some of the issues. Uh, so, you know, if we look at this, you know, when the client uh, gets a message back from the server saying, this is my public key, uh, the client doesn't really know 
uh, which actually server it's sending back. So it lacks authentication of the server. Uh, and so it doesn't really know if it's actually connecting to the right server. It might be actually the a man in the middle attack uh, where it's actually not talking to the server, but it's talking to the attacker and the attacker just gave it a public key uh, S. And you know, if the client would proceed, you know, it would basically be setting up a secure channel with the, uh, with the attacker instead of the server. So we want uh, stronger authentication. Uh, similarly, what we see here is that the messages are encrypted, uh, but they're actually not, and encryption provides us confidentiality, but it doesn't provide us uh, with authenticity. And so uh, it's totally possible for an attacker to modify uh, the bits, you know, for example, of the uh, encrypted messages, and they will come out as you know, some plain text on the other end, and you know, the client and the server won't, wouldn't, be, wouldn't know or couldn't detect that maybe the attacker actually has changed the bits. You know, they're still confidential, uh, but you know, they might have been changed. And so we would like to fix that too. And then finally, there's an issue is that uh, if ever uh, a key uh, the server uh, leaks its uh, private key, uh, then uh, the, the, it's likely that actually the attacker could actually, if the, uh, could basically listen on this computation much, much later if it actually recorded all the, uh, the messages. And so there's another property that we would like to have in addition to the confidentiality and authentication, uh, we'd like the property of something that's called, uh, what's called forward secrecy. And we'll come back to that and see how, uh, what, how we can provide this. Okay, so that's our goal. Uh, and so let's go, go through these uh, three cases one by one, you know, authentication of the server, authentication of integrity checking of the messages and forward secrecy. Um, so first, uh, the authentication of the server. Uh, and the solution, for the, the typical solution uh, that is being used for this problem one is actually certificates. Uh, and the idea is as follows. Uh, there's basically a notion of what is called the certificate authority, which is in charge of uh, authenticating uh, principles. And so for example, uh, it will have a table that uh, record, you know, for every name, for every server, the corresponding, you know, public key. So we have a table indexed by name and uh, then the public key on the other side. And for example, you know, whatever it is, name mit.edu, and it might have, you know, some public key, you know, for, um, uh, for that particular name. And so this is, you know, this is a trusted third party uh, that sits out on the internet uh, and that maintains this table. And then this trusted third party, the certificate authority, uh, basically produce something that's called a certificate. And the certificate is nothing else than a signed statement that binds the key to the name. So for example, it will bind the name mit.edu to its you know, public key. And that statement is actually signed by the secret key of the authority. And so basically this says, this, if, you, if you will, this basically says, the secret key of the authority says that uh, name actually has the corresponding public key PK. And so these are signed statements. Uh, now, there's clearly all kinds of interesting issues with uh, having a trusted third party and how is that managed? You know, can you have one trusted third party for the whole of the internet? And it turns out, you know, the story about actually how certificates actually work out in practice on the scale of the internet it's a hugely interesting topic. And in fact, the Wednesday lecture uh, will be completely dedicated uh, to that particular topic. So I'm gonna spend very little time in, in this lecture, uh, but just, you know, to, uh, just enough to explain basically what the certificate is, because that actually plays an important role in the protocol. And in fact, you know, let's modify the protocol a little bit. Uh, so the protocol that we're gonna, we're gonna replace message two uh, to a slightly different uh, message. So this is the message that the server resends in response uh, to the client who's opening the connection. And what the server actually sends back is a name, uh, a public key for the server, and along with it, uh, this certificate that basically is signed 
by the public key S and it's signed by the, with the secret key of the authority, the certificate authority. And so the, the plan knows as follows, when the client received this message, uh, it should display, you know, it should of course compare, uh, it should check out the signature, just to double check that actually, so it has the name in the public key, uh, it can actually verify uh, that the signature that it received or the certificate that it received actually is valid uh, and check the name against the name in the certificate. Then uh, if uh, the name checks out uh, and the public key that is provided uh, uh, also checks out, then the client actually has some, you know, guarantees that basically at least according to the certificate authority, uh, this, you know, server is indeed called MIT.edu or Amazon.com. And so using the certificate uh, signed by the, uh, the, uh, the authority, uh, the client actually can authenticate uh, the server, uh, assuming that the trusted third party is indeed uh, trusted. So this is an important step forward in our uh, design of a secure channel. Uh, but we can see, uh, we'll see a lot more about it in uh, Wednesday lecture. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, authenticating, authenticating messages. Oops. Um, and the issue here is that uh, encryption by itself doesn't actually provide sort of any integrity uh, guarantees. And so for example, Let's say there's a message like this, you know, transfer you know, one dollar to Bob. And that's the message. And let's say, you know, uh, it will be encrypted, it will be encrypted to some ciphertext, uh, C, and then the receiver will dec decrypt the message. And the decryption is just going to get some set of bits back. Um, whatever, you know, the decryption function of get some bits in and it will produce some bits out. Uh, but what could have happened, of course, is that across when the internet sort of when this packet or the ciphertext you know, transverses the internet, uh, the attacker could be uh, changing the ciphertext a little bit. And, you know, perhaps, you know, this, uh, the attacker knows uh, the format, you know, of the messages and, for example, knows like the first, you know, whatever, six bytes are uh, the transfer of code followed by, you know, four bytes that are a number that correspond to the dollar. And if, for example, like exclusive or is used, uh, and then if the attacker just flips the bits, then basically he could change the ciphertext in a way that, you know, the transfer after decryption will read, you know, whatever, maybe 100 to Bob. And the receiver will have no way of telling that these bits got flipped because basically it doesn't, you know, the, the, we don't have any integrity on, on the bits yet. And so this is why it's so important to uh, actually encrypt or the, the, why, why it's so important to actually have the ability to authenticate messages. And the way this is typically done uh, is something that is called uh, authenticated encryption. And the basic idea is that uh, in the messages uh, that we're going to be sending to the client and the server, uh, for everything that's encrypted, we're going to, the, the ciphertext section is going to consist basically of two pieces. It's going to be, you know, the, the message encrypted with, you know, the symmetric key that the client and the server has set up, plus or augmented or concatenated with uh, a Mac of M of K and M. And, um, and whenever the, uh, you know, the, when the receiver receives these messages, it will first uh, uh, check, you know, what actually the Mac checks out. And if, you know, the Mac change checks out, then it actually will, um, it will decrypt the message and then we'll get the content uh, out of the message. And this is gonna give us you know, both basically the confidentiality as well as integrity of the message uh, M. 
Uh, now, the only problem still left here is that, you know, of course, the attacker may record, you know, the whole ciphertext, you know, the Mac and the encryption parts of it, and replay it back later. And uh, that can, of course, you know, cause problems. For example, if it replays, you know, the same message, you know, send, give Bob hundred, uh, give Bob one dollar, and replays that message a hundred times, then you know we'll still end up with Bob giving a hundred dollars instead of one. And so uh, the way that typically this is fixed is actually sort of similar to what we saw in the last week's lecture, namely using sequence numbers. So the message n. message M must have a sequence number. And so every time when the client sends a message, uh, you know, picks the next sequence number, appends it or uh, concatenates it to the message M, and the receiver must check that basically this is a fresh uh, sequence number before it actually processes the message. And that will give us you know, both you know, uh, authenticated, authenticated encryption as well as uh, replay, uh, replay detection. Okay, so that is the basic, uh, you know, using these techniques, you know, we can take our uh, original protocol uh, and uh, use uh, something that is much uh, stronger, uh, except for the last issue, which is namely forward secrecy. Okay, so um, the issue with forward secrecy is that uh, we're afraid, uh, okay, so at some point uh, the whole communication is done. And so the client and server are done communicating, they you know, go off and do something else, uh, but the attacker might have recorded uh, the complete uh, conversation offline and still has it. And maybe at some point later, I mean, we might be get worried that the server will be compromised and that the secret key of the server leaks. And if that be the case, then in the original protocol that I showed so far, uh, then basically the attacker could actually decrypt the complete messages, right? Because we look back at the protocol here, um, the secret key is encrypted. Well, let me write this, mark this. The, the, the crucial step here is, um, uh, is in the message three where uh, the message, the public key, or the message actually is, yeah, the, the key KK is encrypted with the public key of the server. And so if uh, the attacker records, you know, this message and then later gets hold of the private key, then the attacker will be able to get hold of the key K uh, and then basically able to decrypt uh, all, all communication that actually followed afterwards. And we'd like to do, be able to uh, protect that or defend against that. So we'd like to have the ability or the guarantee that even after the conversation is completely finished and is not uh, in the client server not talking anymore, we want to make sure that the attacker cannot decrypt you know, conversations from the past. And this is why it's called forward secrecy. Um, and so the way we're going to do that is actually the typical way you know, people solve the problem is using short-lived encryption keys, uh, keys for encryption. So generally, it's perfectly fine to use uh, uh, to use public key crypto for uh, authentication or use keys uh, you know, for uh, signing for a long time, uh, but not you know for encryption. And to basically solve this problem, we have to modify the message two one more time. And the server sends to the following client the following bits. Uh, it, it will send the certificate as before, which will authenticate. Actually, let me actually write this out because it's going to be important. So let me write out the whole certificate. Uh, So uh, what's going to be sent is the server is actually going to pick a new public key. And that's a public key that's specific to this connection. 
Um, and it's gonna uh, produce a certificate or in, uh, with it that is actually, uh, it's gonna be a certificate that basically gonna authenticate the public key using the long-term uh, private key of the public key of the server. So it's gonna authenticate PKCon. And again, these keys are just public, so we don't actually have to be encrypted. Uh, but this basically says, well, if the, if the client receives this response, uh, it checks the signature of you know, this certificate, uh, and that will validate uh, the public key of this particular connection, because only you know, the server could have, only the holder of the corresponding secret key of PKS could actually have produced this particular public key. So the server will have, the client at this point will have a strong confidence that it actually is, uh, this is a public key that was generated by uh, PKS or by the server. And then uh, using the server certificate that was sent along, uh, it can actually also verify the integrity or the authenticity of the public key, the long-term public key of the server, uh, and know that it actually is indeed you know, talking to the MIT.edu. So basically it has sort of a two-step process now, you know, it gets a public key, that was signed by the uh, long-term public key of the server. And that public key, long-term public key of the server is actually uh, certified uh, by certificate authority using the certificate. So now at this point, uh, the server has communicated a public key to the client and the client can actually now in the third message, you know, use that public key, this is the public key of the connection, PKK con uh, to propose and encrypt uh, a new symmetric key. And once the server actually has decrypted uh, that uh, public key or the, this, the symmetric key uh, using its uh, private or secret key for the connection, then both parties can throw away uh, their, uh, the PK con and the SK con. And so there's actually no reason for the server and the client to hold on onto these anymore, and particularly on the server side, to just basically delete the SK con and throw it away. And so now uh, there's basically nothing for the, if the conversation at some point ends and the attacker co compromises the server, the whole public key, uh, the secret key for the connection is actually not around anymore. And so it's guaranteed that the attacker can actually not decrypt you know, uh, communications from the past. And so this is a standard technique where basically, you know, use short-lived keys for encryption and only use long-lived keys uh, for authentication. Okay, so that is sort of a basic uh, intro to uh, how to implement a secure channel. And in practice, uh, you know, uh, the, the protocols for secure channels are slightly different depending on like what the objective is. Uh, that is actually trying to be achieved. You know, for example, SSL TLS is slightly different than SSH, uh, but they all really have the sort of same uh, flavor. And where there's some handshake, uh, where uh, a private key or where a public key crypto, crypto switch over to symmetric key, and uh, that the keys are set up that, that can be used you know, for, uh, for corresponding uh, communication. And typically where, where things differ is the way actually keys are authenticated. Uh, so it's interesting to sort of uh, look actually how uh, these big core ideas uh, for a secure channel actually uh, play out in practice. Uh, and that's really what the topic of the paper was, which we talked about SSL and TLS, or what is called now uh, TLS. Uh, but before jumping into sort of this next uh, case study of a secure channel, uh, let me stop here and ask if there are any questions. I, I'm wondering if the Mac, the signing of the tag, is a Mac just the same thing as a symmetric key uh, operation? Yeah, I think the way to, uh, if I understand your question correctly, I think the way to think about it is that a Mac is the symmetric version of signing a verify for a, using a, okay, it's, it's the same thing what the sign and verify do in the public key crypto. 
And I think, you know, if, if it were up to me, I wouldn't call it a Mac, but I would call it a signature, just as in public key crypto, except, you know, it's a signature produced using symmetric keys. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, any more questions? As a clarifying question, um, in the pre previous board or whatever, um, yeah. was the public key of the connection signed with the the server's public key or private? Uh, sorry, I have, thank you. Uh, okay, you spotted a bug, right? This should be secret key of S. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense, thank you, uh, thank you. Okay. Um, so I wanna talk about SSL TLS. Uh, the protocols were originally named SSL, uh, secure socket layer and then got renamed when they got standardized by the IETF into uh, TLS. And basically this is secure channel, secure channel for the web. So basically you know, HTTP itself is sort of an insecure protocol, but if you run HTTPS, you know, or if you run HTTPS, really what you get is HTTP over SSL or HTTP over TLS. And basically the secure channel makes basically this insecure HTTP protocol, uh, makes, basically makes it uh, secure. And there's a long history uh, around SSL and TLS, uh, which I'm not gonna be able to do justice to in uh, this lecture. Um, but, you know, there's, uh, there was SSL 1.0, there was SSL 2.0, there was SSL 3.0, and SSL 3.0 is basically the topic, you know, of the paper. Um, yeah, SSL 1.0 never saw the light of day, uh, you know, when uh, Netscape developed the first version of SSL 1.0, uh, by the time they had developed it uh, and showed it to security experts, it turns out it was completely broken. Uh, and so the thing that actually saw the light of day was actually SSL 2.0. And that was sort of the first uh, secure channel protocol that was used uh, for, for encrypting and authenticating uh, web traffic. Uh, 2.0, as you saw from the paper, had a bunch of issues and therefore was replaced uh, by a new protocol in uh, uh, 3.0, uh, which, uh, uh, you know, was actually widely used for, uh, I almost would say, you know, close to, uh, a decade, at least, uh, maybe not directly as Rio, basically as you know, protocol TLS 1.0. So once it got standardized, uh, once Rio got standardized, it got relabeled TLS 1.0, and it fixed a number of small issues. In fact, it's fixed some of the things that actually were pointed out in the paper that we read for today. And so TLS 1.0 actually uh, served us, uh, or served the internet for, or the World Wide Web for a long period of time, uh, and in fact, uh, again, it did get replaced, you know, upgraded to 1.1 at some point, I think in 2006, if I remember correctly. Uh, and then it got replaced by 1.2 in 2008. Uh, and mostly what actually happened here is in between 2006 and 2008, if you may remember, uh, there, were, uh, there were, it was discovered that sort of standard uh, crypto primitives uh, like MD5 and SHA-1 were really not strong enough. And so they got replaced uh, in 1.2. Uh, and 1.2 is basically still the protocol that we're actually using today. Uh, but uh, since I think in the fall of 2018, uh, 1.3 has been, uh, uh, has been uh, standardized and we're slowly gonna be moving from 1.2 to 1.3 at some point. Uh, it is the case now in 2015, uh, that basically a TLS uh, is forbidden, of, oh, sorry, that SSL 3.0 is forbidden. So it turns out, uh, even though, you know, the paper at, in 1996 concluded that uh, this was a pretty secure protocol, it actually turns out to be, uh, at least in, with today's technology uh, and with our today's knowledge of uh, crypto and protocols, it actually turns out to be uh, broken. Um, and, uh, and I will talk a little bit about the different types of attacks, uh, uh, but uh, because of the change in crypto, basically SSL 3.0 uh, got in, 19, in 2015, uh, basically uh, on the list of forbidden protocols. And uh, real, very soon or now, uh, most browsers uh, will not uh, discontinue the support for TLS 1.0 and 1.1 
uh, because also they have uh, considerable weaknesses. Uh, and so basically, you know, the most of the internet will be running on one, two, and it will be slowly moving over to one, one, three. One thing that's maybe interesting to note about one, three, unlike all the three views protocols, and you've seen this in the paper, uh, back, backwards compatibility has been a uh, big issue or often a, a problem or a kill this heel. Uh, one free actually will not allow uh, backwards compatibility, and so one free will not roll back automatically to one two if the client doesn't if the client can't talk one three, and partly because of these old rollback attacks uh, that you know some of the what was discussed in the paper. So that was a very broad uh, overview of SSL and TLS. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about SSL, three uh, O uh, in the context of this paper. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind, even though uh, SSL 3.0 is forbidden, uh, at, or the first level, or the first level of inspection, or the first two levels of inspection, uh, SSL, you know, 3.0 is, you know, you know, all the other protocols are direct descendants of SSL 3.0, and they have a lot of similarities, uh, and a lot of the issues are in uh, in the details. Uh, that got wrong, but the way the paper sort of does uh, protocol analysis and thinking about uh, whether, uh, what the strength and the weakness of the protocol are pretty are very applicable ideas uh, today. And many of the aspects of the protocol of SL3O are also still, uh, at the high level design, still uh, important. Okay, so before jumping into sort of attacks uh, on uh, SSL3O, uh, let me stop again and sort of ask if there are any questions. Okay, um, so I'm gonna focus uh, not, so the, the TLS or SSL has two, aspect, uh, two parts to the protocol, namely something called the record layer and something what's called the handshake uh, protocol. And you can think about the record layer as basically the third message in the, uh, uh, in the secure channel protocol that we sort of sketched out in the, in the previous boards. And really the handshake is the fewer, fewer, few messages to actually set up the uh, symmetric key that, that can be used by the record layer to basically do authentication and encryption. Um, and so let me, uh, so what I'm gonna focus on is the handshake protocol. And uh, let me start out just showing you the handshake protocol. And so here's, a, uh, here's the ha uh, handshake protocol. Let's make it a little bit bigger. Actually, let me get rid of this on the side so you can see it slightly better. Uh, so this is the actually the SSL 3.0 handshake protocol. You know, the paper doesn't show the whole protocol in one uh, figure. It sort of shows different aspects of the protocol in different figures. Uh, but if you put them all together, uh, this is the, the, the protocol, the, the first part of the protocol, namely the handshake. You know, so to set up the, uh, the symmetric keys for uh, for then subsequently uh, uh, exchanging messages. Uh, so it's in, first of all, the node is actually quite a bit bigger than the, the, the protocol that we talked about, but in essence, it's still uh, the same uh, protocol. So let me walk you through this a little bit so to get a little bit of flavor of you know, what's going on here. Uh, so let's start with the client uh, message. Uh, so the client message you know, contains this version number. Uh, they, this is, uh, for example, saying I'm sp uh, speaking uh, SSL 2.0 or I'm speaking SSL 3.0. Uh, it has a random number that's proposed by the client. And we're going to see that later using the random number from the client and the random number from the server, which you know, comes in the response, uh, the uh, server and the client generate actually key material. Uh, there's a session ID. You know, to basically mark uh, that these, uh, this communication is part of a single session ID. Uh, it's mostly there because later on, there's support for resuming uh, sessions that started earlier so that you can resume using symmetric key and don't have to start over again with public key crypto. We're gonna basically ignore, ignore that. And then uh, there's uh, a set of suites or no names that the client communicates to the server saying that is willing or it can actually support. Uh, so, if we, uh, so maybe say AES, you know, MD5, like a whole suite of different types of ciphers. And the server responds with a server hello message, uh, also with its version number, 
uh, with a random number, uh, with a session ID, the same session ID that the client picked, and then also with a proposal what for the set of ciphers and compression functions. Um, and mostly, uh, the, the, the basic idea is that the client can propose like, well, I'm supporting the following crypto uh, ciphers, server response back saying, well, uh, I support uh, the following set. And basically the idea is that, you know, the client and server agree on the strongest uh, cipher seat that they have in common. Um, and then uh, in addition, so that's what the server sends first, that you know, the set of cipher seats that uh, they have in common. And then uh, there's the certificate uh, message, uh, which in our case was a single certificate, but in SSL and in the TLS, it's actually a list of certificates maybe signed by different certificate authorities. <coughs> and so clients can pick uh, the certificate of the certificate authority that it trusts out of the certificate list and that way certify the public key provided by the server. And then the server indicates that it's done using the server hello, done message. Uh, and then basically the key exchange uh, starts. And this is basically the uh, setting up the symmetric key. And basically, you know, you can think of the pre-master secret as our key K uh, in the protocol that I showed it before. That's encrypted using the server public key. And so only the server uh, with the corresponding secret key can actually decrypt it. And it gets the pre-master secret. And so after message five, both the client and the server have the pre-master secret. Uh, then the client indicates that it's going to switch, you know, ciphers to from nothing to actually the uh, ciphers that it's intending to use. Uh, and it sends a finished message that includes a message authentication code, basically a signature over the master secret, message one, two, three, four, five, or sorry, one, two, three, four, five, and signs that with the client write key where signs it with the client write max secret and encrypts it using the client write key. So there's a separate key for encryption and a separate key for authentication. Uh, and the Mac is there to basically make sure that message seven is tightly bound to message one, two, three, four, and five. And, and so the server can check that one by the time it gets seven it, and the, the key checks out, it can actually check that uh, it got the same corresponding information uh, between one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and that those messages were not spoofed or changed. And finally, you know, the server basically does the corresponding actions. It also sends a change cyber, and then also sends the finished Mac. The clients, you know, supposed to do the same thing as the server, check basically that the signature checks out or the Mac checks out. And once they're done, then they have basically have uh, a symmetric key for encryption and a secret key for uh, signing or macking uh, uh, the normal uh, traffic. And so we have set up our secure channel. So that's the, you know, although the protocol has contains more messages and it's like more uh, verbose, uh, it is in essence, you know, the same protocol uh, that we have seen so far in, uh, in, in the beginning of the lecture. Any questions about the top level protocol before I dive in discussing some of the problems? So where is the pre-master secret used? It is actually used to generate the keys. So when, uh, for example, here there's a client write key and a client write max secret. Uh, that is actually generated from the pre-master secret. So the pre-master secret, you can think about it as a seed for a random number generator from which all kinds of keys are generated. Okay, thank you. Okay, let me switch back to... Okay, so let's uh, talk a little bit about some of the attacks that the paper discusses. Um, and, you know, there's some obvious ones. Uh, so yeah, they, they talk a little bit about pre uh, previous attacks. And mostly the, the, the reason to go for these attacks is to give you sort of the flavor, uh, uh, the, the, the challenges you know, that people think about uh, when they're in the space of designing protocols. Uh, and probably one of the most important lessons, you know, probably from to take from this uh, paper is that um, if you're not an ex expert in crypto or in security protocols, you should not be designing your own uh, protocols uh, because there's a lot of little things uh, that you can get wrong 
and they can actually break the security of your protocol. And so if you're using uh, uh, later on in your life, you're going to build secure systems, you, know, you should use protocols that have been vetted by the security community uh, as being strong uh, security protocols and not cook up your own. Um, and in one way, you know, why secure channels are so uh, important is because, you know, they provide that abstraction that you basically use sort of off the shelf uh, to build uh, secure systems. But it's interesting to see, you know, what kind of attacks actually have happened in the past and what they did. So in 2.0, as the paper meta mentions, you know, one of the particular attacks is you can, the attacker can actually just edit the client hello message. And in fact, you know, what the client can do is uh, he can uh, modify, at least if it's possible in 2.0, and it's not possible in 3.0. In 2.0, the client can just substitute uh, the cipher list with a weaker cipher list. And then, uh, and, and, and since the message, message authentication code didn't cover the first message, uh, that substitution was undetected by the server uh, and uh, undetected by the client. And so it's good, the attacker could sit in the middle and basically uh, uh, listen or you know, uh, uh, intercept all the communication uh, because uh, it substituted a weak cipher uh, for it. Now, clearly, that is a, a problematic. Uh, and in 3.0, this is partially fixed uh, or is fixed because the uh, client hello message, as we saw a little while ago, is actually uh, authenticated through the MAC in message number seven. Um, another attack uh, that actually is uh, vulnerable in 3.0, uh, which is a version rollback attack. Uh, and uh, basically, you know, the idea is that uh, the client can, uh, the attacker can basically intercept a message, you know, from the client, change the hello message to, from version ID 3.0 to version ID 2.0. Uh, the server uh, won't detect this. And, uh, and then we'll be happily, you know, start uh, talking uh, 2.0 uh, with the client. And now, you know, since 2.0 had a number of weaknesses, uh, basically the uh, attacker uh, can listen in on all the conversations because it's actually going over 2.0, which actually has security problems. Uh, and this notion of a rollback attack uh, is a very common problem in uh, security protocols. Uh, and the way, you know, the, in one particular case, uh, the authors notice that you, th this can be fixed. Uh, uh, namely by putting a marker in the padding. So there's some uh, bytes uh, left uh, that were, were not used. Uh, and so the idea is that with RSA encryption or with RSA, uh, uh, with the RSA primitive to actually do the uh, key exchange, uh, you stick a marker in the, a marker in the padding uh, to indicate that actually it is a free O uh, thing. And so that when the client sends a message to the server, uh, independent, it will be, be the free O will be there. So when the server receives that message, uh, uh, it will discover that actually the client can talk free O, even though it got a hello message that said that it was only two O. And so at least you know the server can detect you know that the client uh, that the server, there's an attacker attacking the client hello message in there and uh, remove uh, and defend against that. And so this will give you sort of, sort of like the subtle issues uh, you know in uh, this protocol design. Um, the probably more uh, serious problem uh, that um, uh, SSL had, uh, as, as was pointed out in the paper, is that the attacker could drop the two chain cyber messages. Uh, and let's just go back to the protocol to see actually what that, what that really means. Uh, so. So here's our protocol again. And so basically you know, the observation is, uh, the, 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 the two authors you know, studied this protocol very carefully and they noticed that message seven uh, is actually, hold on, did I? Uh, okay, so the chain ciphertext is message six. And if you look at the list of messages that actually is being authenticated in the finished message, it's actually messages one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, and the chain cipher, 
uh, message actually is not uh, authenticated at all. And uh, the same, you know, as goes here, like eight uh, is the change ciphertext message, but eight actually is not in the list of messages actually being maxed. So it's possible for the attacker to just delete uh, six and eight uh, from the conversation uh, without actually being de detected. And which means that basically the uh, clients and the server will communicate with each other without actually um, any uh, encryption or any authentic authentication. Um, and so clearly that is a problem uh, and uh, that the authors uh, correctly uh, spotted. Uh, as the paper argues, uh, and the implementers, I think, of uh, the original designers of SSL 3.0 uh, intended is that uh, if you receive finished, uh, you should check that you actually received eight too. And if you didn't receive eight yet, you should not set up the secure channel. So basically changing it from a protocol design issue to an incorrect implementation or an implementation issue. And as the, Ar the Arvs argue, that's maybe not the best plan. Uh, it's better for a protocol to be completely explicit in how uh, every step of the protocol should flow and uh, be used. Um, and in fact, uh, one of the major differences between 3.0 and TLS 1.0 was that basically that message seven, uh, the finished messages do cover also in their Mac, the change cyber uh, uh, messages. Okay, so um, of course, in addition to all kinds of uh, uh, protocol issues, uh, there are also implementation issues. Um, and so the protocol might actually be fine and be completely secure, but the implementation might be completely wrong or has a serious bug in it. And for example, not too long ago, uh, there was a famous implementation problem, uh, which was called Heartbleed, uh, which allowed uh, basically attackers to steal the uh, secret key of the server. And, and which is currently quite uh, concerning because once you get the key of the server, you can impersonate the server. Um, and what, what was going on there is that, you know, that turned out to be in the, one of the most popular uh, SSL or TLS implementations, you know, uh, from the open SSL library, there was a buffer overrun. And if the attacker basically exactly as like in lab one, if the attacker constructed the right packets and was able to get control of the server machine, uh, of the server process uh, that was being used by the SSL library, and then basically could steal uh, the server private key. Um, and so uh, in addition to actually getting all the protocol uh, issues right, uh, it's also extremely important that all the implementation uh, is done uh, bulletproof uh, so that actually the protocol is implemented correctly. So I wanna talk one more uh, uh, attack. And that was the attack that basically uh, was the nail in the coffin of uh, SSL 3.0. Uh, this attack was uh, discovered in around 2014. At that point, 3.0 was sort of on the way out uh, because of uh, weak crypto or because after so many years, you know, it turns out some of the crypto primitives were not as strong as people originally thought. Uh, and, um, uh, and basically, you know, this particular attack are uh, really uh, nailed uh, 3.0. And the particular attack is uh, something called the Poodle attack. And, and it turned out there was again, basically, uh, if you real well, a, a small mistake in the uh, design uh, of SSL 3.0 that could be exploited. Uh, and that was discovered at some point in 2014 by you know, some Google uh, engineers. And the, the basically, uh, setup is as follows. Uh, so in HTTP, as you well know from the web security lecture, uh, you know, there's a post message. The post message uh, takes a path, for example, the URL for the website, as well as the path name that actually uh, is tagged on to the DNS name. And the follow of that uh, is the cookie or cookies. And for example, you know, you might have a cookie for your password. Uh, it has some value and followed by whatever, you know, the usual backslash n, backslash r, uh, of a couple versions of it, backslash r, I, I got it wrong, backslash n, backslash r, and followed by the body. 
And the goal in or like the, the, the proof of concept attack uh, that pooled, uh, the, the, that exploited the poodle weakness demonstrated that basically the attacker can steal uh, the cookie or can guess the cookie uh, actually very quickly and very reliably. Um, and the basic attack is as follows. Uh, basically, the attacker sets up some websites like evil.com, puts some JavaScript code there uh, that fabricates, you know, that makes these uh, makes uh, post requests, you know, to the correct web server, say x.com or amazon.com. And so if that JavaScript runs in the user's browser, correct, as we know from the web security lecture, then any cookie uh, that, uh, then the cookies for a.com or x.com will be sent along with the request. And so there's a couple of things to observe here uh, that are important for this particular attack. Namely, the attacker controls two critical pieces of information, namely the path, right? That's the JavaScript can actually expand and shorten the path as much as it likes. And similarly, you know, it actually contains uh, the JavaScript that runs in the user's browser. The bad JavaScript that uses in the user's browser can also control uh, the exact body that actually is being sent uh, to uh, uh, a.com. And so, uh, so what is actually being sent by SSL? So if you look at now in detail what actually is being sent by SSL for this message, at a high level, uh, you know, it will contain an, 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 a bunch of encryption of the message concatenated with a Mac over the message and then appended or concatenated with padding. Then, um, and that is actually sent, you know, to uh, the server. And in this case, you know, we're going to assume that the attacker is a man in the middle attack and actually intercepts, you know, basically these uh, SSL records. So what the attacker has is a bunch of JavaScript running in the browser that basically fabricates, you know, different types of post messages. And what the attacker observes uh, is, you know, uh, these SSL records that are you know, flying by on, on the wire uh, that have the following format. Um, and the basic idea is as follows. It turns out, you know, there's a block cipher used, uh, the standard uh, uh, cipher used in SSL is a block cipher. And basically it in, encrypts uh, sort of uh, 16 bytes messages or blocks at the time. Sometimes bigger, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and so, you know, 16. And the reason the padding is there is to actually uh, pad the message out to something that's a multiple of 16 bytes. Um, and the last byte of this padding contains the length of the padding. And now, really what the mistake uh, in the protocol is, is that the padding is not covered by the MAC. And so it's actually unspecified. In fact, the protocol explicitly doesn't specify that the uh, Mac covers the padding. And so the padding can be just some random set of bytes, you know, followed then as the last byte, the length. And so the basically plan, you know, for uh, the attackers now as follows. Uh, the attack works now uh, as follows. The basic plan is to uh, one, arrange for a full block of padding. And the attacker can do this, right? Because the, the attacker controls uh, the, the path, the length of the co uh, path, and can basically uh, make the message or the, the post request just long enough so that there's a full, uh, uh, 16 bytes of padding. And the last, you know, byte of that padding, of course, then contains the length, and that length is going to be 15 uh, to, of course, to indicate that this is a full, uh, uh, it's a full padded block. Then let's say you want to guess the first byte of the cookie. And what you're going to arrange is that the first byte of the cookie is the last byte of a block. 
And then again, the attacker can do that because you know it can, it can shorten and lengthen the path uh, indiscriminately. And basically, one uh, what happens now next is that when the attacker receives, uh, who sits in the, in the middle, receives their basically this SSL record, it basically takes CI, which contains that particular uh, cookie where the last byte is in the cookie, and basically copies it into the padding. Um, and this is sort of very similar to uh, one of the sort of attacks that was described in the paper, namely in the context of IPsec. Uh, this is very similar to the, uh, let me see what the exact phrase they were using, uh, to like a short block attack. And so, uh, so if you now think a little bit about it, uh, the, the following is going to happen. The server is going to receive, uh, you know, so after the attacker basically copied, you know, the, uh, the block that contains uh, in the last byte, the encrypted uh, first byte of the cookie, copies it into the padding, the server will decrypt everything, and then we'll check the length field. And of course, if the length field doesn't correspond to the uh, number of bytes it received, uh, it actually throws it away and it is, uh, it is incorrect because it will, uh, cannot process the message. However, in the case that the attacker uh, basically, get, so, okay, the attacker is going to go for all possible values of this byte of the cookie. So there's only 250 for this one byte. There's only 256 you know, possibilities. And one of those 256 you know, possibilities will produce a ciphertext that exactly corresponds to uh, an encrypted length field. And so at that point, the server will decrypt it uh, and it will uh, accept the message. And so the fact that the server doesn't reject the message indicates to the server, to the attacker, that it actually guessed you know, correctly. And so at this particular point in time, basically what the attacker knows is that the CI, you know, 15 uh, is actually, uh, uh, you know, in some way after a decryption, a corresponds to the actually, the, it corresponds roughly to the length that's found in the padding, and we know what the length is. It's namely 15 because you know the attacker range to actually make it full padding. So now you need a little bit more. Uh, you need to understand a little bit more about actually how the crypto worked, uh, and uh, basically used a, a, an, uh, uh, a, a cipher blockchain in crypto, uh, which basically corresponds to a bunch of exclusive ors. And uh, and so, in fact, you know, what we know is that if you decrypt with the symmetric, if the server decrypted with a symmetric key, take, you know, decrypt the CI because that's the padding block, looked at block byte 15, we know that uh, decrypted message is going to be equal to the final block, the, 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 uh, it's going to be equal to actually 15. And now it turns out that the decryption actually is just a bunch of exclusive OR operations that correspond to uh, the message I, which is the CI, the plain text for CI, uh, for CI XOR with the cipher text of the uh, cipher text of, of the cipher text of the plain text for the block before, and uh, and in this case, you know, because we're doing the decryption, it is also with the cipher text of the last byte is actually 15. Uh, and I'll spare you a little bit of the details here, uh, but you, you can, uh, there's a link in the lecture notes that you know, go through this a little bit more in detail. Uh, but basically now you have three, you know, two exclusive OR operations plus three bits you know, that correspond to 15. Uh, and you can just move you know, exclusive OR on the left side with CI minus one, exclusive OR with the CN on the left side, then you get uh, uh, by doing the same thing on the right side, and basically mi is going to be you know mi fifteen is going to be equal to you know fifteen plus exclusive four of you know these operations, and bang the attacker has one byte of the uh, cookie, and once you get one byte of the cookie, you know you can keep going and you know play the same trick and move the next byte by changing again the 
half a little bit to arrange that the next byte of the, uh, un the next unknown byte of the cookie ends up in the last byte of this you know, CI, and then you can play the same track, the same trick again. And this basically, uh, you know, sort of a devastating attack because basically, uh, if a cookie is like eight bytes, you know, eight times two and fifty-six tries, then basically, you know, the attacker is guaranteed to actually have your cookie. Uh, and so this is a, a you know, serious problem, and uh, and it turned out it was not easy. Implementation couldn't really fix this that straightforwardly uh, because the uh, you know, the protocol basically required that the padding was not, you know, covered by the Mac, even though it should have been. Uh, what really should have been gone on is you first have to pad and then, you know, compute the message authentication codes so that the message authentication code also covers the padding. And this was a sort of a well-known problem. Uh, generally, in protocol design, people are well aware that you shouldn't be doing this, you know, but, you know, the SSL 3.0 uh, missed this and uh, got it wrong and uh, turned out to be a serious problem. And the reason, even though the protocol was almost dead at the point in 2014 anyway, the reason it was still a problem was there's actually a lot of people were running SSL 3.0 servers at that particular point in time uh, yeah, still. And basically because of this rollback uh, support in SSL, it was easy to take an SSL 1.1 server or, an SSL, or TLS 1.1 or a TLS 1.0 uh, server uh, and uh, roll back uh, to uh, the SSL 3.0, and then you know, then you have this particular worrisome problem that uh, an attacker could basically guess a cookie reasonably quickly. And so this was the really the nail in the coffin of uh, 3.0, even though it served us, you know, for many, many, many years, uh, extremely well. Any questions? Uh, since I'm getting close to uh, wrapping up here, and actually I'm almost running, I'm running a little bit over time. My apologies. Okay, so what should you take from this lecture? Well, one is you should take that basically uh, a secure channel is an incredibly powerful abstraction. You know, you could take an you know unreliable or an untrustworthy internet like that we have today, run a protocol, uh, run, a, run a secure channel protocol over it, and basically you can turn your application that runs on top of it almost into the secure applica uh, secure application. This is not completely true, but to it's a really big uh, uh, foundation for building uh, secure network applications. And so it's a very important concept. And almost every time you build a secure application, you will probably need something of a notion of a secure channel. Uh, the other thing you should probably take away from this is that you should not design your own uh, secure channels. because it actually is very easy to get wrong or miss a subtle detail, uh, like for example, this Poodle attack, and suddenly you actually have uh, an insecure protocol. And so basically don't do that unless you're really an expert, uh, but preferable use you know, existing protocols and uh, implementations uh, so that you have some confidence in, and that they've been vetted by the community and therefore are correct. Um, and that's probably the most uh, important you know, lesson to, uh, uh, take away uh, from this uh, lecture. And then the other thing that probably to take away from this lecture, or at least an important point to make is even though, you know, the paper and, you know, the things that we discuss in this lecture are uh, attacks on protocols, uh, it's by generally, uh, if you think uh, about security sort of in the most broadest picture, uh, these protocols are typically not the problem. So the security problem, problems are typically not in you know, in crypto, not in crypto or in protocols. Uh, overall, you know, protocols that tend to be actually pretty strong. Uh, there might be minor uh, mistakes here and there, uh, but the much bigger security problems are typically outside of the crypto and the cryptographic protocols, uh, where it is like buffer overruns or missing access control checks or uh, web uh, security problems, as you can be seeing in uh, in lab four, uh, they tend to be uh, basically much bigger holes that uh, you know an attacker can drive a truck through uh, to uh, steal the information, and typically exploiting uh, weaknesses in the security in the network protocols and crypto protocols is actually uh, very very hard. Over that, yeah, I want to close this second lecture and. 
uh, feel free to stick around, uh, ask questions uh, if you have any uh, questions. And I'll stop the recording here. <laughs>